go live option there. And I will go ahead and make sure we don't have a bunch of feedback. I think we're good. And I will hit the record as well. Thanks, George, for that reminder. I can yeah. always use it. So good morning, everyone. Um, and I said this and I'll say it on the on the record now, but in this particularly unusual and challenging year, um, and I'm still getting feedback. I'm not sure if that's me or. I'm not hearing it, so. That was me. Yeah. Let's see, sorry. Well, Caitlin, while you while you mess with that, I'll just say thanks, my George. introduction and and, and thanks. Um, uh, if you don't know, I'm George Segrest, the director of the Arts Board, and um, so happy that you're here today. It takes a lot of effort to do what you've done um, and what you're about to do, uh, but our applicants are so um, blessed for it because they get constructive feedback. Um, ho hopefully praise, but if not constructive um, criticism that will allow their projects to be better than maybe they were going to be in the first place. Um, you're in great hands with Mary as your chair here today and with Caitlin and Dale um, supporting the effort here as well. So I wish you all the best. And like I said earlier, I'll be listening in on YouTube. Um, you won't have to see my face anymore. Um, so enjoy the day. And again, thank you for your service. Thanks, George. And I think we've sorted all my feedback issues here. So um, I'll welcome you all again. I'm Caitlin Burrell. Um, I'm the Folk and Traditional Arts Coordinator at the Arts Board, and I manage our arts education uh, grant programs as well. Um, and I said before, before we went live that, you know, in this particularly unusual and challenging year, I think I just want to note that it's commendable that all of these applicants were able to submit a phase two application. Um, and I just wanna frame the discussion that way. It is, it is an unusual one. So I, and they are, and we are so appreciative of your all's time and energy that you put into this review process. So thank you all. And Mary, do you wanna get us started with another welcome and some introductions? I will, I wanna echo the welcome and I wanna echo the thanks for serving on the panel. It's a big job and I've uh, been there before, not with the Arts Board, but um, um, with the United Performing Arts Foundation in Milwaukee, many, many years of grant review and discussion. So I understand the process and what you put into it. Um, I have worked in the arts uh, realm uh, for the last 20 plus years as a consultant and research evaluator. So I've been evaluating um, programs and what they do for kids. And I don't think that there's any more important piece of the arts than its, its power and ability to serve as a teaching and learning tool. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. And I'm, it's an honor for me. I'm in my second year on the Wisconsin Arts Board. And it's an honor to serve um, on this panel uh, for arts education. Uh, such a powerful piece um, for us to be discussing today. And each one of these applications um, is certainly getting the time it deserves um, in the limelight. Um, so thank you. I'd like to ask each one of you to um, provide a brief introduction of yourself, a little bit about your background, and then we'll get right into it. Who wants to start off? I can start. Uh, my name is Symphony Swan Zawadi. I'm newly married, so I'm still kind of going with both names, depending on who knows me. <laughs> um, I my, myself am the director of programs for Arts at Large here in Milwaukee. Um, but my background, I am a practicing artist myself, visual artist. Uh, I was an art teacher for about five or six years um, with K-8 students. And then I served as a school administrator for another five or so years. Um, so I love young people. I love art and I'm just happy to be here. Thank you. Should we go with Carol next? 
Yes, hi. I'm Carol Dolly. I am recently retired. I directed the choirs at Hudson Middle School for 40 years. I've directed church choirs. I still do that when we're not in a pandemic. I sit on the board of directors for the FIP Center for the Arts. I'm the music coordinator and the chair of their building and grounds. Um, I'm kind of involved in a lot of things there. I'm also vice president of the Hudson Women's Club, and we do a lot of outreach to um, uh, areas in our community that, that need financial help as well. So I'm glad to be here and thanks for asking me whoever did. <laughs> Ted, you wanna go ahead? Sure. Uh, Ted Ham, I'm the director of the Etude Group, which is a set of three charter schools within the Sheboygan Area School District. We use the arts and engineering and computer programming to foster creativity and innovation in young people K through 12. Um, prior to that, we've been around for about 15 years now. Um, I have, prior to that, been a school administrator and been a band director as well. Thanks for serving. And then Mary. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I, I'm a faculty associate at UW-Madison, and I'm, I'm pretty much the art ed education program <laughs> in our department. So anybody who wants to be an art teacher in the schools, I work with them for a full year. So I do all the advising, the supervising teaching methods. So it's a, it's a great job. And I've also served on the Wisconsin Arts Board panel many times. So it's, I'm always excited to hear about the kinds of projects people are working on. So that's a, a great benefit of being part of the panel. Thanks, Mary. And Dale, Thanks. do you wanna pipe in there too? Dale is kind of behind the scenes. They'll be working on tallying sure. our scores. I'm Dale Johnson, a grants and information specialist at the Arts Board. I'll be in the background today and I'll tabulate the scores and present them to you when we're finished. Thanks, Dale. Excellent. Well, we've got a really good group here. I'm going to get going with my, um, my introduction and background. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of background. This is a few paragraphs, so um, fasten your seatbelts. Um, the Wisconsin Arts Board is established in 1973. It's the state agency which nurtures creativity, cultivates expression, promotes the arts, supports the arts and education, stimulates community and economic development, and serves as a resource for people of every culture and heritage. Our vision is inspired by a quote from the late Robert E. Gard, Professor Emeritus of Community Theater from the University of Wisconsin. He said, if we're seeking in America, let it be for the reality of democracy in the arts. Let art begin at home and let it spread through the children and the parents and through the schools and the institutions and through government. And let us start by acceptance, not negation, institutions and through government. Let us start by I'm sorry, acceptance that the arts are important everywhere and that they can exist and flourish in small places as well as large with money or without it. According to the will of the people, let us put firmly and permanently aside the cliche that the arts are a frill. Let us accept the goodness, put firmly and permanently aside of art, I'm sorry, goodness of art, which we are now and expand its worth in the places where people live. We embrace this vision. It guides our belief that the arts are basic to human life and essential to the human spirit. And I'm also gonna share the Wisconsin Arts Board values, imagination, creativity, curiosity, freedom of expression, respect and appreciation for all cultures and people, artistic quality, a broad definition of the arts, audience and patron development and community engagement. A major portion of the agency's biennial appropriation from the Wisconsin State Legislature is dispersed to eligible artists and nonprofit organizations in the form of matching grants. Additional funds for grants are also allocated to the Wisconsin Arts Board by the National Endowment for the Arts, a federal agency. The board itself consists of 15 voting members who are appointed by the governor of Wisconsin. These members serve without compensation for a minimum of one three-year term. Members of the board are responsible for establishing the agency's policies and programs for approving all grant awards. The board meets a minimum of four times per year. All meetings are open to the public, just like this one. The board employs an executive director. 
As the chief administrative officer, the director supervises the Wisconsin Arts Board staff programs and day-to-day -day operations. The agency's full-time program staff implement policies and programs, including grants and provide technical and informational services to the public. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> it's a, Isn't it's that a mouthful? formal orientation. And I mentioned before everyone jumps on that we like to just do the scripted orientation to make sure everybody, all panelists receive um, the same orientation. So thanks for bearing with us. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> the aims and objectives of this particular grant program. The arts education component of the Creative Communities Grant Program provides leadership, services, and financial support to create and provide opportunities for quality arts experiences for all K-12 students, Wisconsin K-12 students. The goals of the arts education component of the Creative Communities Program um, are to involve students and teachers in the exploration of the creative process of the selected art form, to provide broad cultural and geographic access to quality arts experiences, and to assist and support artists working in education and arts educators. The role of the panelist. Your role today is to provide expert assistance to the Wisconsin Art Bo Arts Board in its grant making decisions and to help keep the board informed regarding needs and trends that you see. Today, you will be reviewing grant applications according to established review criteria and making recommendations to the board. We would like you to apprise the board of needs and trends within your field and community, either through your general discussion of the applications or in written assessments for board consideration. We would greatly welcome your input and we would value any suggestions and recommendations that you would like to make uh, on the whole grant evaluation process. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the role of the panel chair, my position on this uh, panel. The role of the panel chair is both informational and procedural. So the chair is responsible for providing information regarding the Wisconsin Arts Board policy and ensuring that panel meetings progress in an orderly fashion according to established procedures. The chair is a non-voting facilitator whose job is to ensure that each panelist's point of view is given ample consideration throughout the year review of each application. The panel chair will convene the meeting, uh, review the board's conflict of interest policy and determines whether possible conflicts exist guides the panel through the review by serving as timekeeper and discussion monitor. Pan panelists should focus their deliberations on how each application's proposal meets the established review criteria. The chair may occasionally need to refocus the panel toward the end. Panel discussion should always be constructive, regardless of whether it's positive or negative. At the May 2021 board meeting, the panel chair I will report the panel's recommendations to the larger board. A written report of these recommendations and a summary of comments will be provided by staff to facilitate the process. Panel chairs will clarify these comments if requested by the board. And the chair may also wish to comment on any trends or needs that are identified by you, the panel, or make general observations regarding the overall nature of grant requests. And finally, we will greatly value constructive comments and remarks on each application. Panel comments are sent to all applic applicants when they are notified of the outcome of their grants. And the role of staff. So I will be staffing the panel today with technical assistance from Dale Johnson. And I see we lost Dale here, so I'll try and get him back into the meeting in a minute. Um, staff can answer technical questions um, regarding eligibility issues, whether an applicant submitted the required budgets, or if this applicant asks for assistance in the grant writing process. Staff cannot make any qualitative artistic judgments or tell you their opinion of the organization's or artist's work. So the review criteria, each application will be evaluated based on the purpose of the Creative Communities Program, the goals for the arts education component, and specifically on the criteria areas outlined on your score sheets. Um, you will be asked to score each application individually from one to 20. However you score, we ask that you be consistent throughout the morning. So, you know, maybe don't start really tough and then get easier as the uh, day progresses or vice versa. Um, after submitting all final reviews, each applicant's points will be averaged and ranked. If you don't give a perfect score and you know, we, we don't anticipate that you will in every instance, then please do explain either in your written comments or in your verbal comments 
um, you know, give that constructive feedback there. You will then look at the ranking to identify whether or not you see natural breaks where you wanna put the floor beneath which no applications will receive funding. You have already vetted an earlier version of these applications in phase one. So it is presumed that the bulk of the phase two, a bulk of these applications are worthy for funding. However, based on the additional information provided in these phase two applications, the panel may decide that some do not fully meet the funding criteria and so are not recommended for funding. Please note that if an applicant has received less than 10 points, they are automatically taken out of consideration for a grant this year. Um, and we'd like to note that you will not be asked to deal with dollar amounts. The, the scores that you submit um, on your own and then we'll come back with those ranked uh, average scores, we will use those scores to determine the, the funding you know, dollar amount. And I'll pass it back to Mary. So as we noted previously, the panel chair takes the panel recommendations to the full board. So after the review and ratification of the panel's recommendations by the arts board members at their May meeting, applicants will be notified by grant of their grant decisions by June. You have received conflict of interest forms in the unlikely circumstance that you are asked to review an application of an organization which you or a person with whom you have a familiar relationship are associated, we ask for you to withdraw from all consideration of that application, including participating in subsequent stages of discussion regarding the applicant's relative ranking. The panel should not take any action on any application which would financially benefit a member of the advisory panel or someone with whom a member has a familial relationship. Panelists should be upfront about your ability to judge an application objectively. The perception of conflict should also be considered and avoided. Back to Caitlin. Great. And I think that um, I've received, Symphony, it was just, I'm not sure if you, did you identify any conflicts of interest as you reviewed the applications? No, great. Then our one conflict is just Ted on Dare to Dream. And as I said, we'll ask you to just, you know, turn the camera off walk away for 10 minutes and come back when we get to that application. And finally, the taping of the meeting. So as you've already observed here, we are live streaming this meeting this year um, because it is an open meeting and we'll be recording it as well. And we'll make those files um, and the recording available to applicants um, following grant notification. Regarding the appeals process, we would like to let you know that an applicant may only make an appeal based on procedural errors and not on the basis of artistic judgment. And so I will now take a few minutes to see if we have any questions before we jump into the review process. If we haven't opened up the Smart Simple yet, Will we have time to do that later or should we get it open now? Yeah, I would say if you want to have it open now, especially if you've typed notes there, if you have written notes that you'll be working off of, um, but it's good to have it open that way when we say, okay, discussion is wrapped up, let's go ahead and take a few minutes to score, you can just have it open. And I'll, that's a good reminder that it's, I think it's easiest in Dale's preferences that once you put your numerical scores in, just give a submitted or you know let him know to look to make sure that we have all scores and um, we can move on to the next application from there. Okay, so I should open that now. Is that what you're saying? So yes, if I get great. cut off from this, I'll <laughs> just let me back on. <laughs> I think be, are, you, are you using Zoom in your browser, Carol, or do you have the application on your desktop? Both, I mean, I have oh. them both. Okay, then I think I if you it. just open up a, you know, ex Explorer or Chrome, whatever browser you use, mm -hmm. and get to smart symbol that way, it shouldn't interfere with Zoom. I just use the link you sent us. So what is that? The, just the wab.smartsymbol.com. Yeah, whatever was in the email. Yep. I clicked on that and that's... Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to minimize this and pull up smart symbol. Great. So well, you're that's... still here. So okay, good. A good <laughs> All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, then um, we will... Mary, how about um, if you want to announce the applicant and then I can go ahead and say, you know, on this one, Mary Heffley is the first reader, but, um, and Mary will also be keeping time for us. So we'll have 10 minutes, um, 
her discuss, you know, her application discussion, and she'll give us a two minute kind of two minute warning on both ends. I'll give you the two minute uh, warning. So forgive me in advance for interrupting you if you're on a passionate review and you've got a lot to say. I'm just going to poke in with my two minutes. And know that if there's a particularly, you know, intense uh, discussion going on, there's some flex room there, but we like to say um, 10 minutes per application, ideally. And I'm going to go ahead and add in the chat, just a reminder of the first and second reader um, points you, you know, be sure to include and then we should be good to go. Great. So I will introduce our first applicant, Art Start Incorporated. And Mary is our first reader on this one and Ted will be our second reader. Okay, so I'll just give a quick overview to remind everybody. Um, Art Start is an organization in Milwaukee and they are requesting $6,000 for the third year of a project called Emerging Artists Program. And this uh, program is really holistic. It's a career and personal development for uh, they describe their population as youth at risk, um, often kids who are involved in the courts or homeless, um, in poverty. So it's a, targeted at that particular group of students in, in Milwaukee. And it's a program for 14 to 21 year olds. So it, it spans that age range. And the project basically um, provides six month residencies for their participants um, to basically have access to industry mentoring in fashion design, graphic design, music, dance, theater. And it sounds like these um, participants are paired with mentors in each of those areas of interest for them. They develop a portfolio, um, they take field trips, and they meet three times a week um, as a group and they also have monthly creative sessions. Let's see, what else can I say? And the grant money is to help um, support the, the students get free tuition for this program and they get stipends for participating. Yeah, and there are five artists that are hired under this grant to work with the participants. That's the that's the short description. So I'm going to pull up my notes and just see if there's um, any um, the strengths and, and areas for growth that I wanted to point out. Um, I've read grant proposals from Art Start before. They're always so so thorough, so well written. It's super clear what they're asking for. It's a, a really important group of students who need this kind of support. Um, they have a track record of, you know, as an organization being able to provide this kind of programming. So I, I thought it was a, a great um, proposal. They had a good plan for how they were going to evaluate. And so the only two little things that I would say would, oh, and I also said that they have a, a great um, sample video. I thought that was really helpful to get a sense of of what they're doing, their, their work samples were helpful. Um, so two little things, uh, I think they, it could have been uh, even a better grant proposal if I didn't see a letter of support from one of their many partners. They clearly have a great network in Milwaukee, but I didn't see a letter of support. So that is a piece that could improve and I, the other question I had, and I think it, it might be actually a problem of the way that the grant is structured, is I wasn't sure how many youth are actually participating in this. Because they list the numbers of, of participants affected at 65. But if you look at their work samples, there's like six students who are represented there. So I'm not sure if it's a matter of how the the wording of the grant said like how many people actually, so that's just, I was unclear, like how many students are involved directly, how many will, will, will actually get a residency. So, so that, I'll turn it over to 
rest of our panel members see what, what you have to offer. Thanks, Mary. I'll pass it over to Ted there to follow yeah. up and then we'll open it up. Um, I, I too felt this was a really strong proposal. Um, I appreciated the emphasis on um, youth 18 to 21 who are usually overlooked in, in these kinds of programs. We tend to focus on K-12 youth. So I really appreciated the focus on the 18 to 21 year olds. Um, and I also appreciated the, the focus on mentorship and building career skills. I mean, this was, this was not only a, a, a using the arts to help people process the world around them, but also a career development kind of aspect to it. And I thought that was, I like that mentorship component to it that was so rich in this program. Um, I felt that organizationally, there's broad partnerships um, for them to reach out to the, Mil to the Milwaukee community and places to put students anywhere from schools, specific schools in MPS, Escuela Verde, um, the Walker's, Cent Walker's Point Center for the Arts. I thought there, there's a, there was a nice diverse set of partnerships with it. Um, I thought the valuation system is very robust as Mary had pointed out. Um, organizational financials were solid. And, and, and like I said, just to kind of sum it up, the, the strength of sort of the arts as a career choice, and they had referenced some of the folks who had gone on to, to careers um, or going on to college, I thought was good, but it was also a point of social emotional support for students. So it, it, I think it, it leads the youth in this program to a really fulfilling sort of lifestyle of being able to support themselves as well as using the arts to, as, some, as a level of social emotional support. Um, I, I too had a concern about the numbers, just a lack of clarity about the numbers and, and I'll wonder if it is the way the question is asked in the grant application. I was also looking um, in the application for more detail on the first couple of years and, and the progress that had been made and the lessons that had been learned. They have such a robust evaluation system. I wanted to see more of that. I wanted to see what lessons they had learned from that and what the data had told them and how it informed the, the program moving forward. Those are the notes that I have on this. Thanks, Ted. And Carolyn Symphony, we'll just open it up for discussion at this point. Well, yeah. I thought it was, oh, oh go ahead, well, Symphony. <laughs> No, I just echo the last um, comment that Ted had mentioned about just what were some of the, the more detail in terms of the skills um, that were acquired. Um, but everything else I agree with in terms of the presentation of the, pro uh, the, presentation of the proposal um, was really solid. And Kara? I would concur with that too. And I, I uh, the, that the age is dealt, the older people are, you know, 18 to 21, that isn't covered. It, like he said, it's usually, you know, K through 12. So I really like that as well. Very strong. And the important um, skills that they're learning, they uh, meaningful connections for um, jobs in creative artist industries. And that was excellent as well. I mean, that's it's so much, it's their future and it can, or it can be their future or a part of it. And it, it opens up a lot of avenues in that regard as well. And that there are 19 schools that are um, partners with this program. That's great. Great. Any other comments on this one? If not, I would say then go ahead and use the um, smart, simple, you know, you should now see a box since you've submitted the initial uh, reviews, you should see the score boxes for um, to enter your numer numerical scores in there. And I think as you hit save draft, I think it'll total it for you and then go ahead and hit submit. And after you've done that, just let Dale know and uh, we can move on to the next one. I'm sorry, but I'm not finding where to put the scores. Oh, 
mean, I've got it open and it's the correct. Um, Does anyone, is it, everyone else, do you see the, the score boxes there? Yeah, there's a little box underneath um, the criterion. There's a little box. Just that, that blank empty box? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it doesn't say to put points in there. So I'm like, sorry, right, it's a, okay, it's a, then I'm going to be not, not intuitive enough there, but yeah, if you, um, that's all I needed. Thank oh, you. Great. Yep. Dale, are you seeing um, those average or those scores come through? I see two at this point. Okay. Um, still waiting. No, nope, I see three now. So just one left. Great. And they're all in. So thank you. Great. Okay. And we can go ahead and move on to the next application. Congratulations on being such a de decisive and efficient group. You completed that entire process with discussion and scoring within 10 minutes. So we're, we're cooking. Uh, the next one, artists working in education, um, also and, in Milwaukee. Yeah, and Symphony will get us started on this one. All right. So um, artists working in education is uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, they have a project or program called Arts Envoy. Um, and within this project, it looks like it's a cohort of artists who are going to be meeting bi-weekly, um, virtually for networking discussion, kind of like artist professional development, um, uh, to find some, some best approach, approaches to working with community as a group. Um, they're also going to get like some pro artist professional development from outside resources, but essentially their work is going to be involved around um, a, a community theme and learning how to unpack that and ask questions, think critically, um, and then respond to that artistically. Um, and so artists who are a part or are selected to be a part of this will receive a stipend and a budget for materials um, to then create a piece of artwork um, in response to some of the research that they engage in. Um, I, while reading this, was very excited about um, the format of this program. I think it's really interesting that they um, are using community in a way that kind of puts the artist in a, in a position to research and have conversations with other folks in the community um, and then respond to that. Uh, they, let me just go back. Um, Yeah, so I um, just want to make sure I cover everything and I'm hope I'm doing this right. <laughs> this is my first time. So, um, but they really want to um, work with the community at large and help them become uh, more professional artists and work with community engagement and be more collaborative um, in a way to contribute to like the local creative economy. Uh, and so I think that that kind of sums up the, the, the program. Great. Thanks, Symphony. We can pass it to Carol from there. Okay. Uh, yes. And they're asking for $6,000. Oh, yes. Um, yep. Sorry, <laughs> I'm your back. I got your back, Symphony. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I like the, the hit some of the history of the organization, how they've grown in 20 years from one van to four truck studio vans, full five full-time employees, recruiting, hiring, and training artists to work in the community. Um, and they had, they've received some uh, excellent awards, uh, the Governor Award for Excellence, the People's Choice Award. There's an award, I don't know what it is, in 2017, the Mandy Award, M-A-N-D-I. But they've obviously done some positive things prior to this year and asking for this. Um, and this, the six artists that will be involved. They didn't have a title for their um, program. It's, I know it's artists working in education, but on the, there was a place to put a program title and 
unless I missed it. I didn't see it. it yeah, I don't it's, it's much of a different envoy. Well, I did see that later on, but I did. Okay, thank you. I wondered about that. Thanks. Great. Um, the only thing that I thought was out of, I guess I would, don't think I'd call it a weakness, but I did have a question in the area where it was organization history. It reads that they're able to serve nearly 7,000 children a year, which was, wow, that's a lot. And it's great. I love it. But then children engaged in person, 50. I don't understand the discrepancy. What am I, did they write something wrong or am I misinterpreting something? Was that the organization history of that seven, it said 7,000 each year, but was that I mean a cumulative over the years they've been organized? Because for this year, it said 50. I think the 50 is for this Arts Envoy project in particular, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the 7,000 is, you know, more generally for okay. um, artists working in education that the yeah. user for you. I figured there had to be some kind of a good explanation. I didn't catch that, but good I question. The numbers. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks, Carol. And Mary and Ted, thoughts on, thoughts on this application? Sure, uh, let's see. A few things. I was a little, I think this um, proposal, I, it's really targeting, uh, I think, a, 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 an important need for community artists to just learn how to do community-based art um, projects. So I, I really liked the, the goal. I think it's a little difficult to write a grant for this kind of program because there's a lot unknown. If the rest of you are reading this, like, well, what are they going to make? They don't know yet. They have to, the artists are gonna to have to work with community groups and then they collaboratively generate what the project is. So I was a little unclear of the whole trajectory of, of the project. So it was, a, I have questions about that. Um, that maybe they can't answer, but it's things like in this phase of the project, our K through 12 kids consulted as part of the brainstorming and community project proposal phase. And if yes, who are these children? How old, how many, what role will they play? Because um, that wasn't clear. I, I wasn't really clear on how kids are involved in when and, and, and how they're brought on board. I had then, that same I had that same question in this, Mary. It, it I, I like the process, but I didn't under I mean I like the outcome and I like what they were targeting, but I didn't get enough from the narrative in regards to how were they going to step stay great. And and I understand that that the actual content wasn't figured out, but I was looking for in phase one, artists are going to receive this training. Arts phase two, they're going to work with these area youth. Um, and from these community partners. And, and I felt like there wasn't a listing of where were the community partners gonna be? I mean, who were their people that were gonna let them, you know, connect their artists with kids as a way? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you had more, Mary. I just, I just wanted to connect what you had said because that, that just, I couldn't, I, I read it through a couple of times and I couldn't yeah. quite piece it together. Yeah, yeah. So it was just a, a, a little unclear and it may just be the messiness of a collaborative process. We don't know all, because it, I could imagine some community artists working with a group that didn't have kids as part of it. And another artist working with a different neighborhood community that had kids as part of the collaborators. So, so that just wasn't clear. So maybe they could sharpen that a little bit. The project timeline, I, it didn't have any date in years on it. So I don't know if it's 2021, 2022. I'm assuming it's 2022. So just a little thing to add. Uh, let's see, anything else? I can jump into Mary on the project timeline because that was something that stuck out to me. Um, okay. I think that they started in 2021 and they're requesting funding for those events, you know, programming and work okay. that will take place after July 1. So, okay. and I think it goes into um, January of 2022. Okay. And then the only last thing I had were, um, I had mentioned here, work samples don't give a great sense of collaborative public works led by artists and residents. So it, it, it seems like there was a little bit of a mismatch. I, when I read through the newsletter though, that was more helpful to have a better overall sense of some of their past projects. So, so that's all I have. 
And we're at the two minute. I just had a question about the organizational budget. I think the budget for the current fiscal year showed a deficit. I don't have it up in front of me right now, but I'm looking at my notes and it discussed that there was a deficit and then there was in-kind donation that kind of matched the deficit. And that just raised a question to me. I didn't quite understand. The explanation wasn't real clear to me. And, and so it just kind of threw the, the financials into question for me for this current year. And then they look good for the next year. So I, I, I didn't know if that was a COVID-related deficit or, or what was going on. I didn't catch that when I looked through. Um, does anyone, did anyone else notice that or? I did not notice that. And I actually have it pulled up. So I'm trying to go back and see. Great. Let me pull it up too. I'm just. It's, um, I'm sorry, it's in the next fiscal year budget. So they're showing a, a deficit of 28,000, but their income kind is 28,000. It's their current year that balances out. Yeah. I didn't quite understand the explanation around that. And I don't, I don't think it's a major red flag, but I just thought I'd bring that up in the discussion. Yeah, that's helpful, Ted, just to know that, you know, a further explanation there would have yeah. um, helped in the review process. Any other and comments we're at 10. on the budget Sorry. piece? Oh no, you're fine. If not, I would say go ahead and submit your scores. Dale, are you seeing the scores on your end? All but one. Great. So they're coming in. Yep. And Dale, is it helpful if, if once a score if, is submitted, um, the panelist says, you know, submitted or, or lets you know that it's in? Um, either or, yeah. I just keep refreshing my screen, so I'll see them. Great. All right, I see all of the scores now. Thank you. Great. And we'll move on to the next. Great. We'll move on to Arts and Literature Laboratory in Madison. And uh, Bagaj 
wow, I cannot get my words this morning. <laughs> Uh, the Wajigekwe was our first reader on this one. So Mary, I'm going to pass it to you as a second reader and you can get us started. Okay, so Arts and Lit Lab. And this is a, a program, um, part of their youth arts lab um, area of their programming. And the project is called Indigenous Arts. And they are um, asking for six thousand dollars, and the the project is ambitious <laughs> and wonderful. And they are hiring um, several uh, indigenous artists to lead synchronous online workshops, and um, due to COVID, at least in, in maybe once. Um, we're free of COVID if that ever is the case, they'll be able to move to in-person, but right now they're planning synchronous online workshops. They will create art kits for any participant to be able to pick up those art kits and be able to follow along with the work um, in their own homes or programs. This is the second year of the program. And let's see. I wasn't totally prepared to, <laughs> to be the first reader. So uh, let's see what else I can say as a summary. Part of the goal of the program is to expand the native instructors paid roles to include the community engagement necessary for program recruitment and retention. Um, and it's really um, a key goal is to help um, with cultural teachings from the native artists. So that's the, that's a short summary and it's intergenerational, which I thought was awesome. We almost never have intergenerational <laughs> programming. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I'll just share some of the notes I had um, I had some, it's, and the reason I said it's ambitious is they said they're going to have 40 scheduled meetings. Um, and I thought that it was very cohesive um, with much integrity in this vision and implementation of the project. The proposal was written really clearly. Uh, I'm, I have a, I don't really have a lot of questions about how it will be um, implemented. I do have questions about do participants register for all 40 meetings or do they come only to the ones they're interested in? Um, is there, one of the goals is community building among, among the participants. So I'm not sure how that works if participants only come to every other meeting or once a month or I'm not exactly sure how, I had a little bit of question about that. I might have missed it maybe in there, but um, and let's see, anything else? I guess I was a little curious about their recruitment process. Like how do they recruit people to participate in this program? Um, it's that um, like outreach to the K-12 schools and teachers and after school programs were not mentioned as part of the tar target audience for recruitment. So that that's, if anything, I would say to to explain a little bit more is just how are they going to find the people to participate in these programs? Um, I think that is about it. So I'll turn it over. Thanks, Mary. We can just open it up from here for discussion. I had the same question about outreach and the lack of um, partners listed in the grant. Um, I just, my thought was either this is such a robust organization that they like people just come to it naturally, which happens often with, with organizations that are established, but it would be nice to see here are the people that we link with to make sure that the word gets out and that people know it's coming out. So Mary, I, I wanted to play off of that one with you. I really also appreciated the multidisciplinary aspect of this and, and, and really in a way that I thought respected um, 
native culture and, and art making within native, instead of being sort of focused on one thing, there was, there was such a, a wide array of things that, that, the, that students were gonna get into. I did kind of question like, is there an end result? And this just may be my educator brain coming out and the fact that we're sitting in the middle of state testing right now and you know my brain goes there. But like, was there, is, there, is there an exhibition at the end of this project? Is there something where students are gonna be able to be able to show their work and talk about their work and talk about what they've learned and gained in a sort of public sense in a, in a place where people can respond. I didn't see that in it. And um, just that would have been helpful to me. Kaylor, Carol or Symphony comments on this one? Um, I, I, I really, it just struck me the free and donation-based classes and transportation that, it's so important and I know many of the others do that as well, but um, how do you get people there if they can't afford to get there? And, and if the classes have fees and they can't afford the fees, so it's, they're really approaching it a lot. And I really like the intergenerational and so many things celebrating artists of all ages <clears throat> through exhibitions, performances, readings. There's just so much that they're offering here and it's uh, certainly necessary. And Symphony, any comments on this one? Um, no comments. Everyone has pretty much echoed uh, my thoughts and notes from this uh, um, proposal. Great. I would say go ahead and uh, get to work on scoring. All right, all the scores are in. Thank you. Excellent. Let's move on to Artworks for Milwaukee Incorporated. Thanks. Um, that, I think oh, that's me. You're on it, Ted. That's you. Uh, I was ready to go jump. ahead. Sorry, Mary. Please go ahead. Um, we, this is an application from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, brief summary of it it is for uh, graphic design. Um, graphic design internships. They're gonna partner with three, the Arts Works for Milwaukee is partnering with two organizations. One, they're partnering with ACLU of Southeastern Wisconsin to help these young artists develop some uh, community building skills, some ability to outreach and, and, and sort of foster conversations. The second, con the second partnership is with National Alliance for Mental Health. Um, and that is where they're gonna have the graphic artists um, develop messaging, key messaging around um, mental aspects of mental health. Um, they are asking for $6,000. Um, currently, there are three <laughs> artists involved, 10 youth and 50 adults in this. Um, some of the strengths that I saw in this is I really, I really liked the approach. Um, I really like the approach of um, using graphic design and focusing it on that. They had, the application was really strong in that had it identified a need for graphic design and, and, and the, the career pathways these folks could go to. Um, I thought that was really, really, really helpful. Additionally, I like the notion of, of sort of community involvement or community development with it as well by partnering with the ACLU. And I really like how this is again, similar to, similar to one of the other earlier applications is it was not only about the arts, but it was about sort of social emotional learning as well and really using the arts to help students with mental health issues. It, it's dealing with the stigma of mental health, health issues so prevalent in our communities. Um, 
And I thought that was really helpful. Again, this was one where there was mentoring of, of these interns around graphic design, which I felt was very helpful and, and important. I really like that sort of intergenerational work where we're seeing professionals coming down and working with young people towards a specific process. And the, the narrative was really clear on how it was gonna happen, allowing the young people to have voice and choice in what was gonna happen while still, um, while still allowing for this mentoring process to take place. Um, the evaluation included content standards, which, which I thought was good. So there was, there, was some, there was some measure of the artistic learning or the skill development that young people were gonna be going through. Um, in terms of the weaknesses or areas of growth that I saw for the project, um, there was discussion early on of soft skills. Um, and then it kind of went away. There was no, there was no fostering of, there was no identification of what soft skills we were talking about, no specifics about how they were going to measure that, and and also how they were going to be taught. And that I thought was an area of growth for this specific, um, this specific uh, proposal. So those Great. are the issues that I had. Um, and I think Symphony, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks. Um, yeah, pretty much echoing what you said, but I also um, thought that given the context that this is in Milwaukee um, and with uh, COVID and how the city has been hit, um, the decision to create programming around mental health with this partnership, I thought was um, um I'm sorry, there was some some chaos in my <laughs> sorry. Um, that the the partnership with NAMI and um, the ACLU was was perfect. Um, I also think that um, the career readiness and transferable skills were um, were great. I really appreciated reading this, but I would have loved to see more about the soft skills and even with some of the the graphic design skills, I would have loved to see more measurable um, points to <clears throat> for that. Great, thanks, Symphony. And Carol or Mary? Well, I was just gonna say that I had, they read that, they said that they were geared to older students, which really makes sense. But um, it seems as though they are, they are, they don't ignore the younger students either, but that 18 and over age group isn't addressed a lot. And so here's a place that I think where we're gonna even see more of it, but it's, I just love the whole thing, the three um, raising awareness for all the mental, mental health um, services and destigmatizing mental health illness and addressing youth and mental health is just in like, like Symphony said, during this time of this pandemic, those two, I mean, it's just an insightful um, organization. Yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about this proposal too. It's, it's, it's such a, it's a great project, I think. And it's very, uh, I think, true to how graphic designers work. These students are going to have a client, which is, which is NAMI. And they're going to have to do some research to improve their own understanding about mental health issues. And then the translation of that information and data into something visual, that's what graphic designers do. So I, I think it's a, it's a great, great idea. And um, yeah, so I don't, I don't really have any, anything constructive to add. Any other discussion on this one? And if not, I'd say go ahead and submit your scores. Okay, I see all of the scores. Thank you.
Excellent. So next we're going to be looking at communication, Madison. And Mary is our first reader. Okay, so Communication Madison is in Madison. They're asking for $4,000 for um, supporting their Justice Club programming. And it's a month-long summer camp in which 20 youth use art and writing to explore solutions toward racial justice and increasing equity. And their, all of their artwork and writing that they create in the summer camp will be compiled into a book and printed on their risograph machines that they have in their organization. And then each participant will get one of those books and they'll also sell it in their store and the money will be donated to um, organizations selected by the group. So that's the, um, the overview. Okay, so let me check my notes and see what So I was, there was just um, in the writing of the grant there, and I, I know that some organizations have professional grant writers working for them and others don't. So I think um, there's just some discrepancies in this uh, application that I think could be easily fixed, but things like in the project details, it says that the Justice Club will be a month long summer camp. And then in the narrative, it says it will be two weeks long. So just what, which one is it? <laughs> just to be clear, um, maybe I missed something. That's always for sure a possibility. And then I have questions like, will students do any research, reading or investigation around these social justice issues or speak to them primarily from a personal point of view? Because that would influence what they write about and, <coughs> and the kind of work they create. So I'm not sure if that's part of the education of it or is it more of a expression from personal narrative? Um, let's see. And there were just some things that I was just unclear as a, as a reader, like I'm not sure what they mean to unlearn American style individualism. Is American style different than British style individual? So there's certain terms they used that for somebody who's not part of their thinking um, in their planning, that might need to be a little more, you know, explained a little bit differently or more thoroughly. Okay. I said the artist files were super helpful to help us understand the expertise they'll bring to the program. They had good letters of support from a variety of perspectives. And they have strong partnerships with other nonprofits. Again, I had questions about how students will be recruited. So um, they mentioned Briar Patch as their, uh, one of their partners and where teens will work from. And I thought that they could give a short description of what Briar Patch does and their focus for their services and why the Justice Club is being hosted there. Their partnership was a little unclear of, um, so let's see. And I think that's all I have. Mary, I'll just make a note. I think that the um, summary versus narrative, I think what you're seeing is that phase one information. So it might have started as, you know, a longer program and then based on, you know, the time that passed between phase one and phase two or the, you know, planning process, I think it was condensed into the two week. Got it. Okay, that's good explanation. Yep. Great. Other uh, comments on communication? Um, I, what my notes say um, the application talks a lot about the role of like gentrification and other um, social justice topics. And um, I was just curious about, you know, with some more specificity, how that w is really happening. Like, how are they intending on building more relationships with the community? I don't feel like I saw or felt that with the writing of this, but um, I'm interested to hear the panel's discussion about um, how they plan on building relationships as a part of this project. Well, I, 
I believe uh, in building tighter bonds within their families was talked about and creating space for families, but they didn't specifically say how they would create the space, but um, the creating of space for families to share their thoughts and feelings through art is a way to encourage vulnerability and willingness to talk about difficult subjects. I just wanted to say, I thought their play on words for their title of their program is really, you know, it's called the um, Justice Club at Communication, but then they refer to it as Just Us, which was, I, did anybody else see that? <laughs> I think they mentioned it even, but Just Us, two separate words, as a, and then their full title is Justice Club, so very, pretty clever. I thought it was good. Um, but they are, they are reaching out in um, at this two week camp, increasing the impact of the artist facilitator can have in empowering the youth to express themselves and make changes in their own community. So it amplifies youth's voices so they can, um, voices that aren't often prioritized. So I think they've got, they're going in lots of good directions here to bring the poignant issues to the, the foreground. And it, in this day and age, it's necessary, more than necessary. Um, from the art perspective, I like the, the concept of building a zine. Um, I think that's very relevant to young people. And I like the concept of it being published and sold. Um, and they had the revenue from the selling of it in their, in their budget as well, which I thought was, you know, sort of entrepreneurial. Um, from the program standpoint, they are taking on a lot of social issues, a lot of a strong social justice, which I thought was, was very uh, well received from me. From me. Um, but it kind of getting back to Mary's point of, there just seemed to be some discrepancies in the narrative about how that was gonna to come together. When talking about past, um, past and past processes they'd gone through, they talked about how they partnered with um, the local library to get a book and um, they'd gotten a book and the students had used that as a starting point for the theme in which they were studying in the zine. There didn't seem to be a reference to that. And that, um, I, I just didn't understand how they were gonna take students to imagining this different future. They, I didn't see the concreteness of it. I saw a lot of focus on the zine and the creation of the zine. So that, that content of what students want to express, I think is, is really necessary there. Um, I did like that this was, that they were partnering with the bubbler at Milwaukee, at, at Madison Public Libraries. I thought that was really good. And I think, you know, I know they're partnering with Briar Patch right now. It was good to see that partnership starting to go beyond that to the bubbler as well. So that was another healthy point that I saw in this grant. Good constructive feedback there. Any other comments on this one before you go ahead and score? Go ahead and score. Okay, I see all of the scores. Thank you. Great. Next up is Dare to Dream Theater. And Ted, we'll ask yeah. you to just uh, take 10 minutes and, and join us in 10. And our first reader on Dare to Dream is Carol. Hi. Um, the title of this program is After School Enrichment Partnership Student Theater Celebration. They are from Sheboygan and Man Manitowoc counties, population of about 115,000. They're requesting $6,000. It's a nonprofit 
process-based youth theater company rooted in education and dedicated to high quality participatory theatrical arts for all students. They serve the community through multi-generational theatrical experiences, highlighting growth and learning at all levels. They work with several schools throughout the county. Some of their strengths, strong and successful attempts to reach students who would otherwise not have an opportunity to participate in theater. It's especially important during the pandemic, which has drastically changed that playing field. There's no time or resources in many of the schools to continue to expose students to theater arts. And so this uh, organization is trying to pick up where that was left. There are nine after-school enrichment partners from Boys and Girls Club, Horace Mann Middle School, and anyway, there's nine of them. I won't bother going into the whole list right here. But some, some partners have um, postponed partnership during COVID, but it's very likely they would be back on board when things are back to semi-normal. Dare to Dream identifies professional teaching artists to lead the all-district theatrical opportunity. Virtual or hybrid rehearsals and workshops will be scheduled in the fall with performance streamed or in person in the spring. And it's just there again, it def depends on COVID, but they're being very flexible <clears throat> in being able to do as much as they can. They have support from three local foundations and numerous community donations. For three years, I thought this was really excellent. For three years, they have worked with a marketing communications firm called The Idea Works to help analyze and develop a strategic plan that meets the gaps identified through their research. A series of community input sessions and community feedback garnered from key community influencers was incorporated into the business plan and is steering the direction of the organization. Um, so it supports schools who already have a program. It offers a partnership uh, to at least one school every year that has no theater program. Uh, provides year-long quality out-of-school opportunities. Um, it uh, collaborates with area arts organizations and let's see, will meet the needs of students with special, special needs. Um, for example, ASL students. Um, boy, I think that's about all I have to say. I have some other notes here, but I don't know. I have to reread them and see what was it. What did I write? <laughs> but that, that, pretty much does it. Great, we can open it up and if you, Good. you know, have any other you can add. Mary or Symphony. I didn't have a whole lot of notes on this one. It just, it's a straightforward, to me it was a very straightforward proposal. It was really clear what they wanted to do. It's a really clear need. Most of our schools do not have theater programs. So I, I'm grateful for, to organizations like this that partner with schools and provide that kind of programming that can't be provided during the school day. Like some of the, with music and art, visual arts, at least we have those as part of the school day curriculum. So um, yeah, I didn't have, I didn't not have, I didn't have any questions about it. Yeah, I agree. It was very straightforward. I really liked that um, when it talked about some of the evaluation and documentation, the audition forms and the one-on-one -on -one interviews and observations, um, that was uh, eye-catching for me. I really like the idea of the audition forms. Great. Well, that was quick. Carol, any other comments on that one as you look through your notes? If not, I would say go ahead and submit your scores. And we might have to give Ted just a few minutes. So take your time.
Okay, it looks like they're all in. Thank you. All right, we'll just uh, give Ted a few more minutes there. And then we have um, Farm to Table Foundation, and then we'll take a quick 10 minute break and come back and finish the rest of the reviews. Ted, I'm not sure if you're in your shot of us, but we are uh, good whenever you are able to join us again. We are Great. Welcome back. Uh, we are going Farm Table Foundation Incorporated right now. This was one that um, yeah. I'm going to have Ted go ahead and get us started on. All right. So this is from the city of a uh, from Amory, Wisconsin. Uh, they are requesting $3,450. Um, and I'm just sorry. Short summary of the project is that they are looking to partner um, with the AIM, the Art um, uh, Amory Imagination. Um, it, is, it seems to be a program from the Amory School District that focuses on project based learning as a way to um, foster learning. Um, and I'm just, I'm sorry, Amory Inquiring Minds is the name of it. Um, it looks to be that they will be working throughout the school year um, um, on art projects and then we'll, uh, then we'll be hosting a um, art exhibit at the Farm, um, Farm Table Foundation uh, restaurant space going, moving forward. Um, in terms of some of the strengths with this one, um, it is, I like that it's a partnership between the Amory School District and the Farm Table Foundation. Um, the Farm Table Foundation health uh, financials are very healthy. It shows that things are really well run there. It seems like a very strong and robust organization. Um, and I thought the timeline was very feasible in terms of putting this out. Um, in terms of some questions that I had, some areas of growth is, I really, um, I, I struggled with the substance of what was going on without having any sense of what artwork were kids working on. There was no professional artist in, which was fi which is fine. But then I, I wanted to understand, is there a central theme? It was alluded to in the, in the title of, of the project, 
being about local foods, but then I saw nothing more about that. Additionally, some of the numbers in the proposal um, I struggled with in that um, it talked about two artists directly involved, and then it talked about 350 adults engaged and um, 60 youth would be engaged. And it was a focus on, it was a focus on grades three through five in terms of um, the focus for the age level. So it raised questions for me in terms of, is, are, is this just funding an exhibition of, of students in this, uh, in this AIM program? Are we just funding an, a, a gallery for that? If you're gonna put 350 students are engaged, I immediately put on my sort of curriculum hat and I started going, okay, the arts are about responding. So is there a structure in which we're gonna be asking people to respond to student artwork or that the art responding is one aspect of the arts. Um, and I didn't see anything about that. So it just, the, 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 overall, program, the overall project proposal just, I struggled to understand what, what it was about and where it was going from the theme to it, to how people were gonna be engaged to in it. And I thought, I think it's a great idea. And I think it has a lot of room for improve, a, a lot of growth areas for it to be a really cool project, but I wanted to see more, more substance with it. Thanks, Ted. We will open it up from there. Yeah, that was the biggest thing that I wrote in my notes was that there seemed to be a, a disconnect between like this um, focus on local food and what the students were going to be doing artistically. And so that was one of the things that I noted in my notes as well. Right. I, I saw some pictures uh, that they had submitted and there was, you know, I think I just remember seeing this cool chicken, <laughs> but the the really the students, it, I don't understand what the students will specifically be doing to achieve their goals. I mean, how did she or he, I don't, I think it was, I don't I think it was a girl that had done the picture of the chicken and it was nice, but why did she choose that? And who was that being shared with and what, you know, well, yeah, it was, it was, it was a little unclear. So how, how exactly they were going to use art to reach their goal. Uh, and, and I love the idea of connecting, you know, with the, uh, farming and the and art and cooking and they mentioned some restaurants being involved as well uh, but it just it wasn't real clear as to how that would be accomplished yeah I saw the same exact thing <laughs> it was because I was trying to envision so if I so if I did a still life painting of vegetables I don't know how that represents any learning about local food uh, you know so i think they needed to explain how the arts because in this case it, it's really not about the art making it's about using art as a tool to learn about something else and that's not necessarily a bad thing it's it's a different way it's interdisciplinary it's it's lot, lots of projects do use art in that you know in for other other aims but yeah, it just was unclear of what are the kids going to make? How does this demonstrate their learning about local foods? And the, I had a question about the budget too. Like, wh what is that money being used for specifically with the exhibit? Like, do are they going to be framing work? Or I'm I'm unsure of why they needed the money for the exhibit because if so, if you imagine the art teacher facilitating the learning and the kids make the art and that's all made with school budget money. And then they show it in their gallery. What do they need the money for? Is it for marketing the exhibit? So it was unclear. Um, yeah, so that's all I have. Mary, back to your point about like, about what, you know, what's the purpose of art and local food? Like there was nothing in the narrative that explained to me like experiences kids would have with Farm to Table Foundation prior to it looking at issues of local food or food justice, or even just the science of, build, of, of growing your own food and what that was about and how the art was gonna to link to it. So again, it just, I, it didn't understand, the, it just didn't understand the proposal. Great, great feedback there. Um, other comments on this one? And I would say go ahead and score. And we will, um, once you've submitted, we will take a quick break and we'll resume at 1050.
And Dale just sent me a note to say that he has to um, run to to help someone at the door. So if we uh, if you've submitted, go ahead and feel free to take a break. Don't wait for him to confirm. When do you want us back? Um, just maybe 10.48, does that work? And we can get started at 10.50. Thanks. Thank you.
How you doing, Mary? Good. How are you doing? I got a fresh Good. cup of coffee. Yeah, same. <laughs> They'll pro- probably create a bathroom emergency later on. <laughs> yep. There have been a few times where it's like, can I turn my screen off and run to the bathroom in the meantime? But then the scores come in really fast. So They do. And then you never know how long the conversation's going to go on. Right. It's been really thoughtful and insightful so far. So I definitely appreciate that. Yeah. And you all are making making good time and staying mm-hmm. on track. So we really are. Everybody's so efficient and well-prepared. I just have to make sure that my clock keeps working here. I'm not sure if Dale is back yet or not, but um, when Carol's back, we can go ahead and move on and I'm sure he'll be back in the next 10 minutes. there's carol all right we are we have six more i believe so good work keep it up and uh i think uh mary you want to go ahead and introduce the next one and i will Ted is our first reader yes we're going to be looking at la Follette high school next Great, and thanks, Mary. The, this proposal is from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, funding is for an arts, art exhibition for three drawing classes at La Follette High School. Um, specifically looking at the impact of COVID-19 and the, recent po- and the current pandemic on students um, sort of being a theme to the unit. Um, currently, uh, they are talking about involving 60 artists and 60 students, and the request is for $1,560. Um, I feel some of the strengths on this, the use of the exhibit uh, for student work is really nice. I, I really appreciate that there's an emphasis on, on putting student work out there in an exhibition kind of format. Um, I like th- the proposal coming from formal education, formal K-12 education. I think that's a strength. Um, the project is financially feasible and the timeline is financially feasible. This is one that I struggled with a little bit in terms of looking at areas of growth. Um, In terms of, again, it feels like it's an exhibition and I didn't see anything about the content that was coming with it. Um, And also, again, looking at it from sort of a a response standpoint, like if if the focus for me of a grant is around an exhibition, to me, that focuses on the responding aspect. So you're, you're doing an exhibition to get students to respond to the kind of artwork that's around there. And I didn't see anything around that. Um, there was no discussion of the curriculum that was going into it other than it was gonna be specific to drawing classes. Um, the number of participants in there, um, I, I felt like I, I understand the need to kind of sell your grant and the need to look at young people as artists, but um, to, to put out there 60 artists and 60 students, my assumption was they were talking about the same people. And I think just for the purposes of the grant, I'd like to see some clarity around that. Um, the evaluation criteria seemed to be focused on attendance only at the exhibition. So there didn't seem to be a whole lot around this concept of responding and how the exhibition was moving these young people forward as, as young artists and, and what their experience was gonna be. Um, and, um, yeah, so I mean, that gets to my points in terms of looking at strengths and areas of growth for this grant. Um, I turn it over to, um, Mary. Yeah, I, I too agree 
Ted, I, uh, that's, that's what I picked up from this grant too, is I'm glad to see that public art teacher is applying for a grant. I know that they often don't know how, and so they often are doing it just like, I'm gonna try it. <laughs> and so I think we can help uh, the, the writer of this grant a little bit because the, the things that I had questions about was, I know that high schools already have a gallery. All the, ga all the high schools in Madison have high school galleries and they're already showing student work there without the aid of a grant. So I would wanna know what is special about this show and exhibition that needs grant funding. I know that our budgets are poorly supported, so they all could use extra funding. But I just wonder what's special about this one. Is, will the artwork be framed in a special way? Are they gonna have some kind of special opening reception? Why, why is money needed for this show and not other shows that would be in that same high school gallery? That would be my biggest question. Thanks, Mary and Ted. Carol and Tiffany? You would think after a year of doing this, I would know my mic is muted, but um, uh, some of the notes that I wrote that there seemed to be kind of uh, piggybacking off of Ted, there seemed to be a disconnect. I know that they talked a lot about um, students responding to the current state of the world. So whether it be Black Lives Matter, COVID, virtual learning, um, but there seemed to be a disconnect in, in terms of how the students would engage with those topics to then respond artistically to those topics. And so it just kind of felt like um, they were going to be asked to just kind of, you know, go at it without any formal context. I also noted here... Um, uh, that most of the art making would be happening at home. I would have liked to see, um, in terms of more of a constructive feedback about the proposal, I would have liked to see um, more conversation around uh, how the art teacher planned to offer critique and kind of push the art making um, instead of it just kind of being, they make art and then there's a show. Thanks, I Anthony. And I concur. I mean, I have nothing to add to that. Great. If there is uh, no other discussion on the LaFollette application, go ahead and submit your scores. All right, I'm seeing all of the scores. Thank you. Excellent. So we'll take a look at Madison Contemporary Dance. Okay. Carol, go ahead and get us started on that one. Their program is called Collaboration and Connection. Um, it's uh, based in Madison. They're asking for $6,000 and in their budget, it's clearly delineated how that will be used. This collaboration project reaches out to connect dancers from studio and street style dancer communities, especially where young people do not have dance opportunities available to them. They collaborate with professional dancers, choreographers, and many community teaching free dance lessons in the Madison area. <clears throat> the bulk of the people served are of color and those with limited financial resources. The strengths, they have wide and varied revenues from several venues, including government, corporations, and foundations, and private support. Their calendar is clearly detailed and presented through the summer from July through September. They connect local artists and students by creating works 
that incorporate both dancers and choreographers from different cultures and backgrounds. Plans are in place with COVID protocols when and if necessary. Uh, teach free to participant dance classes in the Madison area. They create a project documentary of what they do during this time and that inspires other communities to create collaborative projects. Provide pro uh, performances outdoors or in a film-based environment and again, depending on COVID. Connecting street style dance artists with workshop and teaching opportunities with local studios. Um, yeah, the main goal is to connect the dance studio world and the local street dance styles community to facilitate and broaden experiences for the local dance public. Um, audience, adults engaged, eight, 1,825. Youth and children, 1,110. So it reaches out to quite a number of um, people, uh, whether it's <clears throat> adults or children, and a large percentage of their grant goes to artistic fees. Professional choreographers and dance teachers are involved. That's, that's it. Great. And Carol, any thoughts on strengths or weaknesses there? The last several things I said were their strengths. Mm. Great. All right, Symphony, I will pass it over to you as the second reader. Yeah, so some of the things that I mentioned here um, as some of their strengths included that um, combination of uh, street style and formal styles of dancing, um, working together with a videographer to capture all of that work. Um, I'm just trying to see. I think one thing that I would have liked to see more is a more thought out um, evaluation. They talked about anonymous surveys that went out via Google form, but I would be interested to, to push a little bit on how you can measure the success um, of the collaboration a little bit better. So that would be my only thing to kind of grow with this. Great, Mary or Ted? Yeah, I, I mean, I appreciated the emphasis here in terms of um, getting different dance studios and different styles of dance together. Um, one of the questions I had, though, was like, I'm still trying to figure out, it wasn't clear to me in the narrative, is the outcome of this just a documentary of different styles of, ma uh, of dance within Madison? Or I, at one point, there seemed to be an allusion towards um, towards dancers coming together and sort of choreographing different art forms and perhaps that was the focus of the documentary. It, it, it just wasn't like glaringly clear to me what the outcome of the project was going to be, but I really appreciate it and like it and, um, and, and appreciated the, the intention that they have behind it. Yeah, I, one, I think we don't have nearly enough dance opportunities for kids oh my god so this is really an, needed <laughs> in our communities um i i think that this organization has so much going on and there was so much talked about in the grant i was having a little bit of difficulty tracking specifically what this project is about because they talked about five different sites and i had a lot of questions i'm sure it's in here it was just there's so much in this grant things like um, I, I made a note, um, there were four past community partners, but in this project, they'll partner with Bridge Lake Point Winona Neighborhood Center. And so my question is, is the BLW the focus of this grant? And if so, lots of the other details in the narrative could be removed because I was getting lost in the, in the details there. Um, let's see. Yeah, and certain things, just basic things like um, for how many weeks does this program last? It says they're weekly dance lessons, but is it for six weeks? Is it four weeks? So just some, I'm sure the details are there, but I just got lost with, with all the parts. So I think just some, a little bit clarifying what just this project is about that they're asking for the grant and then and removing all the other details. Thanks, Mary. Other, uh, other comments on this application? Go 
go ahead and submit your scores. All right, I have all the scores, thank you. Excellent, so now we're taking a look at sharp literacy. All right, sharp um, literacy, yeah. Sharp literacy is in Milwaukee and they've been around for a while doing a lot of programming, arts-based literacy um, work and now they're focusing on some STEAM programming. They're asking for $6,000 to fund a program called Discover Waukesha. And this program will serve 30 third through fifth graders. And those 30 kids will work with the metal artist, Paul Boberitz, Bo Bobrowitz. And it sounds like they are going to meet with Paul three different sessions. They're going to take a field trip to his studio space and see how he works. And in those three sessions with him, I, it sounds like he's gonna take them through the creative process of how you come up with ideas for community-based artwork. They're gonna do small paper maquettes or sculptures um, to communicate their own ideas. And then it culminates in Paul creating a permanent metal sculpture in one of the parks there in Waukesha. So yes, so that's the summary. So let me see some comments here I made. I think that the, the proposal, I mean, it was well-written and Sharp has a great track record of successful projects. Um, let's see, let's see what else. I guess I was a little unsure they could have added a couple sentences about how does the artist know how to facilitate this kind of work with kids? Because I'm not sure how, you know, from this artist's work, it's clear he's a productive artist. He's, they, they gave some um, links to his website and his artwork, but I'm not sure, like, has he worked with kids before? <laughs> and how does he know how to facilitate that? Or will there be an, a, another partner with him to help him work with that age group. I, I just wasn't clear about that. Um, let's see. And I also pose the question, do we have any work samples of Paul's collaborative work with community groups? Has he done collaborative work before? I'm not sure. He's clearly an active artist. Um, just unsure about his work with community groups, but um, yeah. Uh, uh, that's all I have. Thanks, Mary. Ted, Carol, Symphony, feedback on Sharp? I would just like to say about, I don't know anything about Paul either, but this group seems to be so well, well organized. And like you said, they have a, a good history of, of organization. So I, I just would take it for granted that they would have vetted him and figured him out before they used his name or you or, or got him on board with it. So I'm not worried about that, but it would have been a nice thing to add, but it doesn't worry me. Yeah, I agree. The only area for this that, that I had some questions was in the area of evaluation and just really clearly understanding what they were going to, I mean, what they were going to evaluate um, and how they were going to go through it. I just, I wanted to see something about the create some evaluation on the creative process that the students were going to go through with Paul and and how those students were growing and what what kind of impact they were having on that but it well run organization good 
program. I liked all the community partners that they have um, and, and like the concept behind it. They talk a little bit about that with the C Wonder Connect. That was something that I, I noted yeah. in my notes as well. Just yeah. a little bit more detail about what that actually looks like, it, sounds like feels like would have been great. Yeah, and I'm so I'm familiar with the artful thinking palette and, and that kind of stuff. And I just wanted to see more like, okay, you're gonna use that. How is that supposed to impact student thinking and student um, student art creation? What were they gonna do with that? Was where I was going. Great. I love the focus on evaluation. It really year to year, panel to panel, it depends on you know, what are points of highest points of interest. So it's, it's good to hear that piece. Um, if there are no other comments on sharp literacy, uh, go ahead and submit your scores. Do we have all four scores, Dale? Yes, they're all here now. Great. Okay, our next applicant is the Solomon Community Temple, UMC. And Symphony is our first reader on this one. Awesome. So this project is asking for $6,000. It is uh, the title of this project is the Interdisciplinary Saturday School, um, an outside open studio with a theme of water. Um, this organization um, has a history of racial and social empowerment within the Harambe neighborhood in Milwaukee. Um, and so they um, intend to reach out to primarily uh, black students in grades four through eight for on and off site programming to develop uh, a sense of community and ownership in the Harambe community using art. The outside studio was open to all ages and will run weekly during the summer. Um, part of this, this whole um, program is part of a larger goal to build a aesthetically a pleasing park on the property. So this is, feels like this is a uh, stage one of a much larger um, uh, project. And um, the Saturday school uh, focuses on the, the water theme, which they are working with UW Milwaukee School of Architecture and Urban Planning to kind of get that rolling for the park. I'm just pulling up my notes too. Um, uh, what I appreciated about um, this grant um, is that they're gonna have on-site supplies for the community members to kind of just drop in and engage with some art making um, to build community. Um, they're using the community input to help towards that larger project of building a park. Uh, and they're also gonna provide field trips uh, as a part of this process for the students to, um, to be more engaged. They're recruiting students who live in the surrounding neighborhood, um, which I think is really cool. Um, and that's pretty much all I have on this one. Thanks, Symphony. Mary, Carol, or Ted? Yeah, I had some questions uh, about this proposal. I guess I was wondering a little bit more about the curriculum for the outdoor open studio. Is it is it a, a, a pure choice-based experience where 
kids come to the open studio and they can use whatever materials are there and make whatever they would like. And so therefore the, the organization serves as like a, like providing materials in a space to make it and no curriculum. So that would be nice to have just a little bit more clarification about that. Will, will participants actually be led through a particular process? Will they be taught um, specific techniques or just some clarification on that. And let's see. And I don't know if this matters, but I'm just wondering about the content and the themes of the programs related to the Solomon Temple's mission as a religious institution. I'm not sure how those work together um, or other than the Solomon Temple is a community center. It serves as a community center for the neighborhood. But I'm just wondering, does this program that they're proposing, how does that fit with their own mission? I'm, I'm not I, sure about that. It may I, be a yeah. secular program. So I guess them acknowledging that it's secular kind of separates itself from the religious uh -huh. component um, of the organization. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you for. Yeah, they did say this summer that offers secular, nonpartisan, interdisciplinary Saturday school for youth and an outdoor open studio for all ages, and that was significant. I thought they mentioned later that they because there's little safe space for outdoor gatherings because of COVID, and so this will be a good thing for that. They also said the primary, primarily, they'll reach African American children grades four through eight. Not that they're exclusive to that, but that's the primary focus. And their focus is on water conservation with environmental studies and agriculture. They're going to keep field journals to document and connect the ideas and the sketches to the various environmental um, societal contexts. Um, they'll provide um, art demonstrations and on-site lending of the supplies. Um, there was something else I was looking at. I can't remember. I lost it. I'll see if I can find it again. <laughs> Yeah, I liked it a lot of what they did, but there isn't a, a detail like how exactly is this going to happen and what is the ex the exact curriculum they they give. Yeah, you're right. There's there's hints of of all of it in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just kind of yeah. clarifying it and yeah, um, it's going to. I found what I was looking. It's going to focus on water conservation, environmental studies, and agriculture. So those are the focuses, but they didn't give details on how will they accomplish that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the only other couple little things I had, I, I just thought it was, they were super interconnected with the neighborhood community at all levels of the project with planning and implementation and presentation. So I thought that was great. And the only other thing I would, had a question about is, did, did all of you read this correct? Like that it said that they're going to serve 16 students in 10 classes over the, is that all? Because it seemed like it would be a fairly expensive program for 16 students if they're asking for $6,000. So I may have misread something. So that's, that's all I, all the comments I had. You have to go back and look at that. Yeah. I missed that. Yeah, I'm going back too, because I, I didn't see that. Any 18, 18 youth being served by this. 18, okay. Yeah. Six adults and three artists. And I don't know if that matters, but it, it was just a question because I know that um, in our orientation, they said it, it, whether it's a small program or a big one, it's just the cost for 18 students. It, it was the, a question I had. That's, that's all. Yeah, Mary, I would. Oh, go ahead, Ted. No, the artists is uh, the costs are particularly to artists. If memory serves, I'm just going back through the proposal budget, proposed budget again. Artistic fees and services, and then operating expenses. So again, the operating expenses just seems a little 
when, when looking at budgets, that just seemed a little ambiguous to me in terms of understanding what they specifically would be putting that, putting that money towards. So it looks like tools, materials, and things like that. I liked I like this proposal. I think it's hitting a high need area. I like the interdisciplinary nature of it. You know, as, as even taking even working with the Milwaukee Sailing Center to get people out, get these kids out on the water. I think that's a great experience for them. I had a similar sort of not concern but point of confusion as to uh, is this just a drop in and and students can and kids can drop in when they can with their families or is it like you're signing up for each Saturday, you know, are you enrolling in each Saturday school class um, and therefore doing the whole, the entire summer work with it? It just, it, it wasn't clear to me in the grant, but I liked it. And if you can get eight, if we can get 18 kids taking this kind of experience, I think it's worth, worth the funding. Other comments on this one? I think that's really helpful feedback in terms of structure and, and the budget piece and um, and Mary, good memory about the orientation piece about it. it's not necessarily about number of, you know, youth or community members served um, if it is a quality arts experience. So, um, but a good, a good note about the you know, operating expenses piece. If there are no other comments, go ahead and submit your scores. All right, all the scores are in, thank you. All right, so we'll take a look now at the Building for Kids Incorporated. And Carol is our first reader. You're muted. I'm sorry, it's showing me that my last one on the Solomon community <clears throat> didn't, wasn't submitted correctly. So I'm just making sure I go back through it, make sure I have everything I need to have. That's no right, problem. that's right, that's right. Okay, hold on, I found it. Okay. There we go. I hadn't filled in all the comments, but done. Okay, <clears throat> the building for kids, and this is not used as a verb, it's used as an adjective, it is an actual building for kids. And uh, it started out pretty small, I, the details are list, listed, but it's grown into a, a pretty amazing thing. Um, it's from, uh, it's called, they're, they're adding with this building, this actual physical building, an artist in residence program. And that is the title of their program. It's in the city of Appleton, which is 74,000 people. Um, the summary um, air, which is artist in residence is a new component of an existing project. And then they use the, the, the acronym BK, BFKCM, that's building for kids, children's museum. So instead of saying that each time, I'm just going to say BFKCM. <laughs> it's a museum in the heart of Appleton. It includes a drop-in staffed art studio open during museum hours. It also includes a small theater seating for 70 children and families and innovation lab and three additional flexible program classroom spaces. The BFKCM is updating its visiting artist series to be an artist in residence program. This AIR program will engage at least five local artists in a year. They will focus on diversity, cultures, backgrounds, and or media. 
Artists will receive a stipend for an eight week residency. They will host studio hours where they can re create or compose their work. They will host four interactive workshops with the community and engage with families on a personal level in-person small group settings, or a hybrid of both. They are ask, the amount they're asking is $3,600, which tells me they kind of know what they're doing. If they don't need the full 6,000, they're narrowing it down and they're being frugal, I hope. So they look good to me. Their strengths, uh, primary audience is early elementary age children and families and educators and their classrooms, but it's designed to be accessible to all demographics. Art produced will be a combination of professional artwork by the artists and residents and beginner artwork created by the children, families, students, and educators. Artwork by air will likely become part of the museum's permanent collection. <clears throat> the arts education coordinator will provide guidance and support to the artists and residents as they design their workshops. <clears throat> and. Um, it's an intergenerational play-based learning experience. There we go. Ed, the second reader on this. Oh, yeah, so some of my thoughts are, are strengths on it. I like that it's increasing the publicly uh, public accessibility to visual arts um, outside of the K-12 formal structure. Um, I like the concept of a teaching artist coming in um, and, and being part of that accessibility. Um, and it just generally strengthens the, the, the access to the arts in the Appleton community. I think some areas where um, I saw some potential for growth in this, uh, in this proposal was specifically around sort of an absence of formal partners or the narrative didn't discuss it. If you looked at the board, there were partners listed like the Appleton Area School District and other folks. But I, my, what I, when I read this proposal, I had this image of these, this artist doing great work for eight weeks in this space and people not knowing what's going on and not knowing about it. So I was wondering how they might leverage their partners on their boards to really make sure the community knows what's going on and aware of it. And again, they may have a plan for this. I, I, I just didn't see it in there. Um, financials, I, I understand the hardship that most museums are going through right now. And the financials in the, in the proposal were addressed around that. I was just looking to see there was a potential deficit in there. And I was just looking for a sentence or two to discuss that the, the museum has a plan for managing that deficit should the numbers not come back after COVID-19. Um, and then uh, the evaluation methodology. Sorry, I guess this seems to be my theme for the day. Um, my, the evaluation methodology seems somewhat vague. There seemed to be some hesitancy to um, tracking attendance, but I thought because of COVID-19, but that's a great, it, it, let's, 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 my thought is we need to track it. We need to understand how many kids are coming in because it tells us how, what, how the re relevancy and what percentage of kids are coming to the museum and participating in the artist and residency because that gives you a baseline that you can look at for the future. Um, and I didn't really see a plan in there to understand the user experience, the kids experience with it. What were, what were they doing? And um, I thought that would be really helpful in this proposal moving forward. Those are my thoughts on it. Thanks, Ted. Mary and Symphony. I'm going through my notes and the only thing that I have that I at least just want to say out loud is I did I don't know and it may be in here and I missed it but um was there a plan specifically um to kind of speak to the pivot due to COVID that some museums have had to do in terms of creating virtual opportunities and so I know they were planning for a lot of in-person activities but I was just hoping to see if there were opportunities because they measure success at um the workshops and having artists um fulfill that Part of their residency but i was hoping to see a little bit more about um pivoting uh some of the workshops in a virtual capacity and then sharing that information out with other partners um even if you couldn't get folk inside of the actual um i don't i don't recall seeing that but i did want to touch on something which ted had brought up i have some notes here that each 
artists and residents will create two workshops and program participants will be surveyed immediately following their experience. Participating artists will fill out self-evaluation surveys and daily assessments by the director of programs will evaluate and, and uh, adjust what's, what's working, what's not working. So it, it looks like they've got some good hands-on things. Let's see, and the only things, two little things I had is, <laughs> it doesn't seem like they're paying the artists very much. <laughs> and I don't, they don't have a lot of money, but they're only asking for 3,600. And I mean, for an artist to be there for eight weeks doing open studio hours and planning these interactive workshops, that's, I just wish they could pay them more <laughs> is one, one thought. Um, and then I just wasn't super clear how they partner with the schools. And because they said that each artist in residence is going to create an interactive workshop specifically for educators. So how do they incentivize participation from the educators? <laughs> um, or how do they reach the educators? Or um, I don't know. I, th I think that that, that I do like to understand the mechanisms there of how do they communicate with the schools and how do they, yeah, how does, how does that work? One of the notes I have here is that they will host studio hours where they can create or compose their work. And so would this, I, I think then the students would come to them. They will host four interactive workshops with the community and engage with families on a personal level, but how it, it moves into the schools, it's not clear, you're right. Other comments on this one? If not, go ahead and submit your scores. All right, all the scores are in. Good, so our last um, applicant is the UW Board of Regents on behalf of Performing Ourselves Community Dance Program. And Mary is gonna get us started and then Carol as the second reader. Yeah, so Performing Ourselves is one of the programs that the UW-Madison Collaboratory uh, organizes and they're a dance, education organization and they work in several schools, elementary schools in Madison in, in on site at schools after in after school programs. And let's see, what can I say specifically? I mean, the, it's, this is such a well-written proposal. <laughs> you can tell that it was written by people at a university. <laughs> I mean, especially the evaluation. Ted, I bet you're really happy with the evaluation one. <laughs> I mean, they have evaluation covered. So I think it was super clear of what they're doing. They're trying to expand this Performing Ourselves program, specifically with the New Madison Youth Arts uh, Center. It's a brand new, beautiful building in Madison. And when I, I remember the question I had after reading their initial proposal is, you know, is this an, why is this site important? Because they already are running this program in, in after school um, sites in, in school buildings. And I thought they made a good case with this second version of that the, the dance space in the new facility is a professional quality dance space. And if you think about how most kids would never have that experience because dancing around in a school cafeteria 
is not at I would think is not the same as to dance in a professional studio. So I think that that experience will be really wonderful for Kelly Brink. Um, and so the, they're asking for $6,000 that will cover artistic fees, travel for the kids from their school, um, their schools to the, the Madison Youth Center. And let me just quickly check some, if I have any other specific I, I had a question. I was a little unclear how students will be chosen for this site because it sounds like they're recruiting kids from the other sites to come to this one. And so I was a little clear, unclear on how that will happen. And anything else? They've got great partnerships uh, already established. I love that it gives opportunities for the UW undergrads to also learn how to teach youth. Uh, and that is so strong. And I think that's all I'll, I'll say right now. Um, let's see. Um, the the performing arts teachers will offer a series of eight week dance classes on site at, that Mad at the Madison Youth Center. Um, it's wonderful. The grant will is supportive of transportation, which you had mentioned making a, the logistical element feasible for partner organizations. There are nine schools that partner with performing ourselves. And some, I would think that then finding memberships for this would come through the schools but like you said, it wasn't real clear. Every school and community center partner is intentionally paired with a teaching artist, a um, performing ourselves member or an undergrad teaching intern. Those were all strengths, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. Ted or Symphony? I agree with most, with everything that was written or spoken already. I do as well. I thought it was a strong proposal. Um, a couple of details that have been pointed out that need to be ironed out or just made clear in the grant proposal, but I felt it was strong and I felt like a well-written proposal. Great. If there are no other comments, go ahead and submit your scores and then, um, We'll take another quick break while Dale does the averaging and ranking of those, and then we'll come back and look at those averages. And I'd say, let's take another, Dale, will 10 minutes be plenty for you? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so maybe um, I'll give you a minute to submit those scores and then uh, maybe we'll come back around 11.46, is that good for everyone? Great. Yeah.
Dale, would you mind um, dropping that in the chat too? And I can share my screen. Oh, okay. That'd be great. I could do that. Did it work? I've never sent a file through here before. It did. Would you mind sending it to everyone? I, oh, I'm yeah. not sure if I can copy it. I think we, well, maybe that's not the best way to do it. Maybe I'll just share it and um, we'll do it that way. Okay. If for any yeah. reason you don't want to share your screen, if you want to use it for something else, I can share it here too. Yeah. Would you mind doing that? You could go ahead and pull it up. It's hard to, I don't have the dual monitor here. Sure. Thank you. That's as big as I can make it. <laughs> that looks good on my end. I'll give you all a few minutes and looks like Carol and Symphony haven't come back yet, but um, yeah, take a look. And um, there's everybody. First of all, thank you all. The hard work is almost finished. Uh, I think this next part is sometimes the toughest, but um, you, you all did a fantastic job and kept us right on time and things moving along. And um, yeah, and I want to sort of frame this again in saying that all applicants that were able to submit a full phase two application this year, you know, pat yourselves on the back because this has been quite a year. So um, now we basically, I'll ask you all to look at those average rank scores. And uh, if there's a clear break that you see where you would recommend setting a floor. So any application, you know, below a certain point would not be recommended for funding, um, you know, it's, it's usually somebody has to get us started. So if, if anyone feels strongly there, please go ahead. Um, we're just looking for your recommendations here on funding. Just wondering, is, is there a limit or how many we can or can't or what? Good question. We don't, because we don't ask you to deal with the dollar amount and it really depends on our budget year to year, we say, you know, just use your scores here and the applications that were in front of you to make that call. I'll get the conversation going. I would say there's a clear break um, at 15 in terms of funding for this. So anything below a 15 would not be funded. I'm just putting that out there, just looking at the numbers on the average. So under Artists Working in Education, La Follette and um, Farm Table Foundation would be the two. That's my proposal right now. Yeah, that's the clearest break. The only other place maybe to discuss is maybe in between 15 and 16, but that's not a huge gap there either, so. So I think probably one or the other.
Carol or Symphony, thoughts on Ted and Mar or Mary's situation? I echo, I echo Ted. With below artists working in Ed? Yeah. Yeah, I, it's fine. It makes sense. Yeah, I prefer that one too. That That's was, easy. Yeah, <laughs> consensus. There it is. So it sounds like the recommendation is that uh, top 11, I think, and the bottom two, that gap between the 15.13 and 11.63 um, is where you'd say to set the floor. Yeah. Well, would uh, you repeat what you just said? I, I thought we were going to say something. Just repeat what you said, please, Caitlin. Yeah, just to you're recommending that the top 11, so, you know, artists working in education and up. You're mm -hmm. recommending those applications for yeah. funding. Um, and it's just those bottom two, the 11 and 10 scores that you're not recommending for funding. Well, if we have consensus, that's, that's great and quick. And Mary, um, as she mentioned in the orientation, will take that recommendation to our full board at our May uh, meeting. And then applicants will be notified within the, the month, um, so sometime in May, early June. But thank you all. You did fantastic work and like I said, kept us right on time. This last part is really um, kind of evaluation about the process, feedback, feedback about what you see here, applications you don't see in the mix, um, you know, Ted, the conversation that evaluation tools could be stronger. Um, yeah, any feedback you have about, about the grant review process and serving as a panelist and the application itself. I just had that little, that little issue that came up in a couple of the grants because I think the way that the grant format was written of participants, it, I don't know if, if it would help to separate it out, like how many will be directly participating in the program and then then maybe another estimate of how many total would be impacted by it. Because if there's a one small group of kids creating an exhibit together, that's like 10 kids, but hundreds of people could come and see that exhibit. So I think that that was not, I, I don't know if that's a, that's just a structural issue with the way that the grant template is, I don't know, so. And that's helpful. We're always looking for feedback on the actual application. A lot of the grants that we go for for the schools, we're submitting and then they'll come back and we'll have, there'll be a revision process with those grants. Is that is that true for the Wisconsin Arts Board grant? So what, could you go back to some of these people and say, this was a significant issue, but not only from the panel, but from the Arts Board side, you have two weeks to fix this kind of thing. I don't, does that happen with these or no? Yeah, we've had, um, I think that the local arts panel actually, which was Friday before last, they sort of recommended all applications with a kind of caveat that one of them, we were looking for some clarity on one piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't tell you what that is now, but yeah, we've done that before. Um, I guess it's less common, but if there's a, kind of outstanding question, the, the application as a whole looks solid, but there's a piece that, you know, maybe a red flag that we need clarification on. Yeah. And then the ones that we don't recommend getting funded, will they be, I mean, we could have asked you in the, in the panel discussion if they had reached out to you for support and things like that. Will there be a recommendation that they reach out to you in the future for support on this? You know, we, we want to support you, but, you know, come and come and talk to us, please. Yeah, I'll follow up with those two with, you know, a summary of the feedback that you provided or just recommend that they, you know, if they didn't tune in today, tune in and um, listen into your feedback because it was, it will be really helpful moving forward. Um, but always offering to provide, you know, technical assistance in the future and encouraging them to apply again. So two things that would have been helpful for me was being able to review the training that we went through. And I couldn't find the video for it. Mm. 
Uh, but it would have been helpful to have that at my fingertips. Just going through, I, I, I kept everything as a draft until last night. And then just being able to kind of go through that after, you know, do one an application, go through that and, and take it from there. Um, I forgot already what my second point was. That's good to hear though, Ted. Oh. This year, I mean, last year, you know, we had to transition suddenly yeah. to a virtual panel meeting. Um, so we had more time to plan this year, but it's always, it's, it's just different than the in-person meeting where we're all around a table having this conversation. Um, I think the second it, point, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, I know that I bogged you all down with emails. So thank you for, <laughs> I understand that it's probably buried somewhere. I but, um, yeah, and I, I looked for it this weekend and I couldn't, so I'm not sure, couldn't find it. The second thing would be helpful to know what kind of training is offered or support was offered. So if there was a training offered to applicants, that helps me understand the kind of quality that I should be looking for in the applicant mm -hmm. and where to specifically put more, put more emphasis. Right. Like if they had attended a workshop that was offered or if we provided one-on-one -on -one technical. Even what, yeah, even what the kind of, like, what is the content of that workshop? Because then I know, like, here's a group of people that had access to it. And if they chose not to or they didn't hear it or something like that, then, I, you know, I'm kind of reinforcing the same message that the Arts Board is putting forth. That's helpful. Other thoughts about the applications? that you reviewed or applications that you were surprised not to see? I think it's, you know, as I look at this list, I think it's worth noting that, you know, one of very few rural applications, you know, was not recommended for funding the Amory um, Farm to Table and the, um, the, you know, La Follette High School. So it's, uh, it, I, I always bite my tongue because I want to say more than I, <laughs> but. It's hard, uh, isn't it's, it hard to get around the fact that certain organizations have grant writers? And of course those proposals, they're easier to follow. They know what they're doing. They've been trained to do, to write these things. So when you have organizations that don't, but I guess, I mean, the process itself, you, you are providing all this feedback. So hopefully they don't give up. Hopefully they say, okay, I'll take this and, and we'll rework it and submit it again. So. Ted, I heard some of your feedback. Symphony and Carol as first time review panelists, thoughts on the process? It was cruelly time consuming because I am a ducks in a row kind of person and I created my own charts to keep, you know, <laughs> and yet I, I, it was so interesting for me to listen to people who have more experience than I and, oh yeah, oh, that makes sense. Make notes for, you know, another time. Um, but it was, it was hugely, well, I say cruelly, it wasn't cruel. <laughs> the pandemic is cruel. This was not cruel. This is just, it was time consuming, uh, but well, well worth it and very worthwhile. I was, I frankly, I was impressed with every one of them for different reasons. And certainly some were a little better than others, but there, I mean, there's such legitimate requests and, and rationale behind their requests that it was nice to know people care and are moving forward and trying to make things better. Symphony, how cruel was this? <laughs> no, it was definitely a lot, but I think um, not impossible. And so if asked to do this again, um, I would feel much more confident. I'll say that. It's tough not knowing what you're getting into, yeah. <laughs> jumping on Zoom, and, but you all did fantastic. So, and if you haven't already, I think, I think I have Ted's, maybe it's just Symphony, the um, W9 and the new supplier form so we can pay you. Yep, I'll get that so, to you. That'd be great. Other feedback that you have, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mary, for keeping us on time and moving along. Well, thanks to everybody. Talk about you bringing your own empathy and your own experience 
to the review process. I think it made it such a valuable discussion and we're right on time, so efficient. And I'm well, happy, I was happy to meet all of the other panelists. It was nice working with you. That was smooth sailing. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, thank you. I appreciate hearing everybody's perspectives on this. It was really helpful. And thank you all again, just one more time for making time for this and time for the reviews. I know it's a commitment, but it means, you know, it makes our work possible and it, I know it means a lot to the applicants and it makes the whole process possible. So well, th thank I you. Just, Caitlin, I wanted to thank you because I had, did have questions, email questions. And so then everybody got stuck with my answers, but <laughs> Caitlin was so fast in getting those answers out. And then I appreciated that. So, and thanks for all that you do, because I'm sure you're doing much more than what we just saw in those emails. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> well, if, uh, you know, I will release you then to the, the rest of the day, but yeah, just appreciate your thoughtfulness and uh, okay, so good to thanks. work with you all. Thank you. And I'll be in touch with a short kind of panelist evaluation form too. Okay. So. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>